everyone. Welcome back to Relax with Animal Facts. I am Steph Wolf, and today I am going to be learning with you about our furry, scaly, or possibly even slimy friends. And in today's case, it is definitely going to be a scaly friend of ours, maybe even a slimy friend of ours, because we are covering the oh-so-wonderful gecko. This is a very special listener episode dedicated to Charlie, who wrote in and sent in the podcast's first video submission for an animal suggestion. So everyone, a round of applause for Charlie. It was a very uh, cute video that was sent to me. I love when you guys send stuff in, or in this case, the first time ever receiving a video submission. It just makes me so, so grateful uh, to be a part of, of this community with you guys. So thank you very much, Charlie, for the wonderful video you sent in, and I hope you enjoy your podcast episode. Now, many of you have noticed and written in uh, with some worry and urgency as to, you know, where where are the episodes the past few weeks. So if ever you guys realize uh, there's, there's some trouble with the scheduling or with the uploading of the podcast, you can always go to the Instagram, relax with animal facts and follow that page because I will be updating you guys as to anything that's going on. In this case, there have been some extenuating life circumstances that have gotten in the way of me doing um, doing the podcast and being able to record a good episode for you guys. But now we're right back on track, and I'm very excited to get us back on our regular schedule of every Monday. So please continue to send in your uh, animal suggestions either to Relax with Animal Facts on Instagram or you can send an email to Relax with Animal Facts at gmail.com. So thank you guys for your concerns, for your thoughts, um, but everything is a okay and it brings me great joy to be uh, back on schedule uploading for you guys. So we're going to go to a review coming from Jet Star Guts uh, via Apple Podcasts, writing all the way from Australia. Jet Star writes, I am loving this podcast. I hope there are many more seasons to come. I am thinking of animals I can submit to talk about. I love learning the facts of all the animals. Steph, you do a really great job. Thank you for thinking of this podcast. Jetstar, thank you so much for your wonderful review and for your kind words. I want to visit Australia one day, and I hope that this podcast can get... um, to a point where I'm able to meet some of you at podcast conventions and and things like that. Um, I hope in the future that is possible, of course. If you want to leave a very wonderful five-star review like Jetstar did on Apple Podcasts, it is one of the biggest things that you can do for the show because it helps the show grow and reach more people so that we can continue to grow our animal podcast family. And if you like Relax with Animal Facts as a podcast, you might like it as an audio course, which is available on listenable.io. If you just type in Relax with Animal Facts and use the code Stefan Wolf at checkout, you can get a seven-day free trial and listen to more relax with animal facts without so much of the trailing and the different things that I do. There's no ums and uhs in there. So for those of you that really don't like that part of, uh, of me doing that, that listenable course might be your cup of tea. So before we get right into the show, I'm just going to share with you guys the resources that I used that made this episode possible. 
I got my facts from LiveScience.com, Britannica.com, and Treehugger.com. I will be leaving those resources in the show notes, so if you want to read more yourself, you are more than welcome to. So let's not dilly-dally anymore. So wherever you are listening, if you are sitting in a chair at home, if you're on a walk outside, if you're laying in bed at night, it doesn't matter where you are, I want you to scan through your body and search for those places of tension. And where are you carrying it? For some of us, it may be in our head, in our back, in our neck, in our legs. Everybody's different. In my case today, it seems more in the shoulders. So what I want you guys to do is to focus on where that tension is and try your best to relax it as we go into this immersive experience together with me, Steph Wolf, into the jungle where the gecko resides. The first fact of the show is that geckos are mostly small, usually nocturnal reptiles with a soft skin. They also possess a short, stout body, a large head, and typically well-developed limbs. The ends of each limb are often equipped with digits possessing adhesive pads. And this is one of the coolest things about the gecko are the strength of these adhesive pads that we'll get into just in a second. Most of the species are 3 to 15 centimeters, that's about 1.2 to 6 inches long, including the tail length, which is about half of the total. So they have fairly large tails for the size of their bodies. They have adapted to habitats ranging from deserts to jungles. So at the top of the show, when we say where we're going to be going, of course, I want to make it a little bit more simplistic at the top of the show because sometimes the habitats will be more than just one place. Some species frequent human habitations and mostly feed on insects. Geckos are spread across six families, and I will try to pronounce all six for you guys because I haven't been able to post an episode in a couple of weeks. So this is for you guys. I hope it makes up for it. So the six families of geckos are Carphodactylidae, Diplodactylidae, Eubulferidae, Geconidae, Philodactylidae, and Spherodactylidae. So I hope you guys enjoyed that because it hurt me on the inside. Of these, the Eubulferids, a group that includes the banded geckos of the southwestern United States, the cat geckos of Indonesia and the Malay Peninsula, and others have movable eyelids. A quick side note that the longer I've been doing this podcast, the more I've noticed these certain group names and uh, different classifications of things being incredibly hard to pronounce. I am genuinely considering whether or not researchers name certain things just to make the general public sound goofy, because it certainly makes me sound goofy. So most geckos have feet modified for climbing. The pads that we learned about just a second ago of their long toes are covered with small plates that are in turn covered with numerous tiny hair-like processes that are forked at the end. These microscopic hooks 
cling to small surface irregularities, enabling geckos to climb smooth and vertical surfaces and even run across smooth ceilings. And some geckos even have retractable claws. So that is just so, so cool that they're able to cling to pretty much every surface with the exception of just a couple of them. But if you have a pet gecko, you probably know this fact more than anybody. So in their efforts to avoid predators, geckos will appear to be fast enough to sprint even across the surface of a body of water without sinking. Although this ability has been shown in only one species, the flat-tailed house gecko, herpetologists argue that many other geckos may also possess it. For those of you that are wondering what the word herpetologist means, don't worry. I didn't know either. Herpetology comes from the Greek word herpeton, which means reptile or creeping animal, and it is the branch of zoology concerned specifically with the study of amphibians. So if you ever hear that someone is a herpetologist, you know they study amphibians. Similar to snakes, most geckos have a clear protective covering over the eyes. The pupils of common nocturnal species are vertical and are often lobed in such a manner that they close to form four pinpoints. If you don't know what a gecko eye looks like, whenever you have the time, you can search it up because four pinpoints is a great way to describe it. As opposed, of course, to us as humans, which if you look at a loved one in the eyes or if you look in the mirror, uh, you can see that we have spherical um, pupils as opposed to that four pinpoint pattern. I think humans would look a little bit freaky with the eyes of a gecko. A gecko's tail may be long and tapering, short and blunt, or even globular. The tail serves in many species as a storehouse of fat upon which the animal can draw during unfavorable conditions. And this is not something that is specific only to the gecko. Animals will have different places for fat storage depending on their physiology and anatomical structure. For example, the camel. The camel will have big fat stores in its humps, so when unfavorable conditions come, they can survive for a great amount of time. In the case of the gecko, they prefer the tail. The tail may also be extremely fragile, and if detached, will be quickly regenerated in its original shape. If you want to learn more about regeneration, it's actually covered on the uh, online course on Listenable. That was a very, very fun episode to make. But anyways, unlike other reptiles, most geckos have a voice. The call differing with the species and ranging from a feeble click or a chirp to a shrill kind of cackle or a bark. Now, it's hard to imagine a gecko barking, but I think it is something that I will Google right after this podcast episode. The gecko's eyes are 350 times more sensitive to light than human eyes. So here, just reading that, we can kind of reason as to why that is. Most gecko species are nocturnal, which means that they will be hunting mostly during the nighttime. And many animals that hunt during the nighttime 
will need some kind of advantage, whether it be the use of eyes or very sensitive hearing or maybe a certain mechanism like echolocation in the case of bats. But for geckos, having very sensitive eyes in terms of light is going to help them to navigate the blackness of night. According to a 2009 study of the helmet gecko, it will discriminate colors in dim moonlight when humans are completely colorblind. The sensitivity of the helmet gecko eye has been calculated to be 350 times higher than human cone vision at the color vision threshold. Now, those are a lot of fancy words to describe something fairly simplistic, which is just to say that their eyes are about 350 times more sensitive to light than us. The optics and the large cones of the gecko are important reasons why they use color vision at low light intensities. So it is a very cool thought to think that while we can barely distinguish any color during the dimness of moonlight, geckos can go about their business in a colorful world. Some species of geckos have no legs at all and look more like snakes. There are upwards of 35 lizard species in the Pigopodidae family. This family falls under the clade of Gecota, which includes six families of geckos. These species, all of which are endemic to Australia and New Guinea, lack forelimbs, meaning the limbs at the forefront or at the front of the animal, and only have vestigial hind limbs that look more like flaps. Vestigial is a fancy term for just meaning not useful. There's no use for it. Scientists say that vestigial limbs are leftovers or remnants after an evolutionary process in which they kind of grow out of use for a certain structure. The species are often called lakeless lizards, snake lizards, or thanks to the flap-like back feet, flap-footed lizards. I like flap-footed lizards, although it would probably be hard for me to distinguish whether it is a lizard or a snake. Like other species of gecko, pigopods, as they can be called, can vocalize, emitting high-pitched squeaks for communication. They also have very good hearing and are able to hear tones higher than those detectable by any other reptile species. Geckos can live for a long, long time. Their range in lifespan depends, of course, on the species, but many will live around five years in the wild. Several species that are popular as pets, however, can live quite a bit longer. In captivity, a well-tended gecko can live between 10 to 20 years. Leopard geckos, specifically, average between 15 to 20 years of age, and the longest-lived individual is recorded to be at 27 years old. By golly, that is older than me. So a pattern that we see quite commonly that animals in captivity will live for quite a lot longer than animals in the wild. And that is because of the fact that their environments are controlled and not completely up to chance. There are veterinarians that are available for people who have sick animals, but in the wild, it's the wild. There's no real vet to go to. Geckos are actually masters of color. It is not only the chameleon which can change color to match their surroundings, but the geckos can as well. 
What's more, they can blend into their environment without even seeing their surroundings. In studying Moorish geckos, Domenico Fulgione and his team discovered that it isn't their vision that the geckos will use to blend in, but rather the skin of their torso. They will be able to sense rather than see their surroundings to camouflage themselves using light sensitive proteins in the skin known as opsins. Other species of gecko are particularly adapted to blend in with their habitat based on their skin patterns and they can be made to look like rock or like moss. I have to say that upon reflecting on all of the mechanisms that we've covered on the show ranging from echolocation to here with camouflage, I have to say that I think camouflage is one of the most interesting. Animals that completely change their appearance to blend in with their surroundings looks simple and beautiful but on a molecular and chemical level can be so, so complex. And I think it's one of those things that we can look at and just sit in awe and wonder at the beauty of the animal kingdom. The flying gecko, or called the parachute gecko, which I love, is a genus of arboreal gecko species found in Southeast Asia. That word arboreal, for those of you that aren't familiar, it just means that they spend the majority of their time in trees, in the treetops. While they aren't capable of independent flight, they get their name from their ability to glide using the flaps of skin found on their feet and their flat rudder-like tails. The flying gecko can glide up to 200 feet, which is about 60 meters, in a single bound. Despite measuring only about 6 to 8 inches, that's about 15 to 20 centimeters, in body length. Those are quite amazing leaps and bounds that these little critters take. They take these huge leaps of faith in order to survive in the wild. So for the final fact before the name of the gecko and what it means, the fact is that the smallest gecko species is less than 2 centimeters in length. Geckos can vary in size, but the smallest of all species can fit on a dime. It is known as the dwarf gecko, and it is one of the world's smallest reptile. The small gecko has an equally small range. It is believed to be limited to only the Jaragua National Park in the Dominican Republic and Beata Island. So they are probably very cute, but I imagine very easy to lose. So now let's get into the final fact of the episode, which is the name. So for those of you that are new, I always like to share with you guys, what does the name mean or where does it come from? So when we talk about the origin of something and like the origin of words, we use the word etymology. And the etymology of the word gecko is that it comes from the Malay dialect and is imitative of its cry or of how it sounds. And the word gecko was taken from the Malay dialect and established in the late 18th century. So that is very, very cool. I think that we've had a couple of animals that have their origins from the Malay dialect, if I'm not mistaken. And I have a story of someone who wrote in online about a gecko. If you want to share a story that you had with a certain animal, maybe when you suggest an animal, you can also send in a funny story if you have one. So this story says, I have a story to share about my leopard gecko. So I'm sitting on my bed and I'm holding my leopard gecko and he starts to crawl up my arm 
and he sat on my shoulder a while. Then he starts to run, so I scream. My mom runs in, and I shout, I lost the leopard gecko. And then I turn around, and he's sitting on my back. So these geckos can run very quick, and because they can stick to almost anything, you never know where they're going to turn up. So I just thought that that was a cute story to share with you guys. So if you want to have a podcast episode dedicated to an animal of your choice, you can either write into the Instagram or send a video message on Instagram as Charlie did today, which is so awesome. You can send that to Relax with Animal Facts on Instagram, or you can send an email to relax with animal facts at gmail.com. Whenever you guys write in, I try to respond to each and every one of you because I get so giddy and excited whenever I read a new message from you guys. If you've ever written in and you haven't gotten a response, please do so again. I try my best to answer each and every one of you. Thank you to all the patrons who support me on Patreon and any other way that you guys support me. I am so, so grateful for that. And you make doing the podcast in a time of financial difficulty very much possible. So I hope you guys have enjoyed this episode. And I hope to see you on the next podcast episode with the next animal. Take care.